So, uh, the, the, the name of my presentation for you today is Stalin. Can, can somebody explain to the technician which lamp he has to put on or not? I mean, uh, I've been in many museums, but that they just keep that one is, is I, I will leave. It's, it's impossible. It's really impossible. It's, it's like in an configuration. I, it's really... How's that? Are we better? Uh, yeah, but, I mean, they must be able to put some more lights on. I mean, we can't be in the dark like that either. Well, while they're fiddling, if you don't mind, because I'm just very conscious of time, and while they're fiddling with the lights, hopefully this will, will kind of shine enough light. Um, a Starman lands in Chicago, so I just want to briefly go through the story of that. There's quite a lot of detail, but we can skip through, and you can always ask them questions afterwards. So we first heard about this show, this opportunity, in September 2013. So we had about a year to start planning this show. Uh, before it actually arrived at the MCA. And I have to say it was the most unique and incredible experience for us as a museum. For 103 days, it felt like we had the presence of David Bowie, the man, in our institution, even though he never turned up. It was just an incredible um, internal experience, let alone external experience, for us as an institution. The show had been hugely successful at the v &A course. It had been hugely successful before it came to us. It was at the uh, Art Gallery Ontario. It had done very well. And we were the only US venue. So our timing was great. We got it really early and managed to grab this show, which is really exciting. So just to give you a brief overview of the show, there's around 300 objects, all owned personally by David Bowie in his archive. It covers around five decades of his work. It's made up of photography, artwork, costumes, <coughs> handwritten lyrics, performance uh, footage, rare performance uh, uh, footage. And it really showed how David Bowie had both influenced and been influenced by art, design, theatre, uh, fashion, contemporary culture, and so forth. And there was a real focus on this show about creative expression, about collaborations that he'd made, about diversity. This was also, there was a huge multimedia um, element to this show. It's by far the most technically complex show that we'd ever mounted. And it actually came with a, a headphone tool, which I'll, I'll come back to uh, in a sec. Now, in terms of why we actually chose this show, why we took this on, for some time, the MCA Chicago has been the process of defining its new brand and its new brand platform. And what came out of that was a positioning statement for us, which was this, that the MCA is where art is now. And this is, this is working very well for us as an institution because it actually reflects our commitment to our audiences. Our commitment to them is to present the art of now, the most contemporary art, whether that's challenging, whatever it might be. Our duty as a contemporary art museum is to present that. And that reflects the MCA's beliefs that we are artist activated and audience engaged. We're multidisciplinary in what we display. We reveal the creative process. We're experimental, etc. And when we use this filter, um, to decide whether we should do the David Bowie show. We really looked at his ability to blend the boundaries between creative genres, his willingness to reveal his process, and his incredible legacy of influencing contemporary artists and performers. And putting that together, we felt it was a really great fit for the MCA. Um, I won't lie, it was a very difficult uh, period for us. There was a lot of people that rejected the concept of this show, but ultimately, through a lot of work with the curator, uh, particularly working with groups and helping us to understand. Marketing, we were like all over it, you can imagine. But there were other areas that were less keen. But this, this concept of where art is now and connecting it to way, the way Bowie and influence and influences contemporary artists was the kind of key to that. And we're so glad we did the show. The other huge component was the contextualization of the David Bowie show. So we had a really varied array of supporting contemporary programming whilst the three, for the three months that the show was on. So St. Vincent gave a talk, Michael Clark, the British choreographer, performed, Todd Haynes, uh, the director of Gold Goldmine and so forth, and Sandy Powell won an Oscar for costumes, were all there, um, doing various lectures and talks. So there was a really nice contemporary feel to it. And then in terms of sort of the old guard, people that were there at the time, of when David Bowie was in some of those periods. Brian Ferry performed at our gala. Boy George did a set. Um, uh, uh, this lady here, his name, uh, Ava Cherry, was there at the show nearly every day. She was one of Bowie's girlfriends. So there was that sort of context that, that really helped us with the show. So just to give you a brief idea of where we were at the very height of the, the show, um, 
the press we were getting uh, was, was really excellent for this show. We were getting great from the general press. The art press was sniffy about it, but we expected that. But the general press were very positive, as well as the responses of the audience. I mean, in quite a few days I um, chatted and interviewed people as they exited the, the exhibition, and people were in tears. I mean, a number of people left the thing, physically moved. Some people stayed in the show for six hours. It was, it, I mean, three hours, four hours, six hours was not unusual. So that we really sensed the sort of impact of the show um, on our audiences. In terms of, you know, we had lines around the building despite the, the horrendous weather. We were all over the press and the TV. There was very much a sense that Bowie was an event. This wasn't just an exhibition. Uh, 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 the MCA. This was an event for, uh, for Chicago, and that was something that we very much tried to um, kind of engineer or, or help to happen. Um, despite of this, we did uh, have attendance targets to reach that we had to reach, which were 150,000 visitors. This actually makes David Bowie's the most successful show in MCA's history. So in that three-month period, we needed to get that, that amount of people in. So this was very central to these conversations we had about should or shouldn't we do this show, was, you know, were we going to bring the people in, were we going to be able to uh, meet our targets and our revenue targets. So what I've tried to pull together in this, because it has been such a complex process, is what I call the fundamentals of how and why we put the show on. Starting with number one, there were so many considerations for the institution and I'll, I'll go through those related predominantly to communications, even though it's much wider than that. So our first fundamental is that Bowie was coming to Chicago, not to the MCA, just to the MCA. It was about those partnerships. It was about those relationships. We were lucky because we had a huge amount of people in the community that wanted to work with us. But what we started on was those city and civic relationships. And they were really, really important, the unpaid ones. Who do we have to sort of cozy up to, how are we going to make the success using the city? So we had a very close relationship with um, to Chicago, who are Chicago's tourist office. They um, had goals to, uh, from the mayor to be able to turn Chicago into the cultural center of the US. So it was very nice for us to be able to play into that by bringing David Bowie to Chicago. We worked with the Chamber of Commerce to attract businesses. One of our best partners um, was Concierge Preferred. And we did a huge amount of work with the hotels and the concierges, giving them special tours, giving them giveaways, giving them information so that they could talk up the show. And that was really successful for us. And then finally, and most humorously, the D case, which is Chicago Department of Cultural Affairs, working with the city, um, we got the mayor, our mayor, uh, Rob Emanuel, to actually announce David Bowie Day on the opening of the show, and he was actually there. And so it was, it was a real sense of working with the city, working with our neighbors to make this into a big event, which was, was great. Secondly, in, on our fundamentals is, is, of course, how best to spend our marketing dollars in terms of paid and owned and, and so forth, in terms of our media. And the first thing was we average, on average, spend about 100, just over $100,000 on a show of what we call a special exhibition on our fourth floor. And I had to work very hard with my team to convince the board and the institution that that wasn't going to be enough money to do what we wanted to do and launch the show. So to cut a longish story short, we got to 400000 as a budget uh, uh, for, for a marketing budget. So it was really, really important to set out a proper realistic budget around marketing if we were going to reach at least 150,000 people. And even with that budget, we had to plan very carefully, and we broke the spend down into three key stages that we saw for the success of the show. One is when the tickets are on sale, so a big push at that moment. A big push when the show opens itself, then a huge big push for that final sort of fortnight, two weeks, three weeks period when the, the show is about to close, because we knew everyone's going to want to see it. They're all going to say, you know, they're going to wait, they're going to wait. And that became something really important for us. We built a lot of anticipation with our media uh, beforehand with the press, and we were, of course, constantly feeding our social media channels to support this conversation. Very, very briefly, the other thing was to identify our audiences. This has turned into a huge project for us, which is really developing personas. Who is this show for, and in fact, who is any show for that we do? Generally, the attitude is, well, it's for everyone, isn't it? And we have so many conversations around show or content being for everyone. And we were determined to break that down that as a contemporary museum, we're not for everyone. 
but actually our audiences fall into three distinct personas that we're in the process of developing. Where at one end you've got people that don't care much about art, it's not much of their lives, right through to people where art is their life. And we've actually got these three profiles. The cultural consumers we talked about earlier are the, the sort of leisure class. They're people that should come to us but don't. They consume popular culture, but they're, for whatever reason they're not seeing us as part of that popular culture. That is by far the biggest opportunity for our institution and certainly the biggest crowd for the Bowie show. We knew that. Then the art seekers, those that are more actively engaged in art and activities, and then the art professionals. So there's a lot of detail around this. But just this breaking down of our audiences and being able to talk about shows internally as art, well, that's more of a cultural consumer show. Or, let's be realistic, Doris Salcedo, that's more of an art seekers, art professionals. And it's been a real turning point in discussions with our curators. Um, in terms of how we spend, in terms of paid relationships, we did something we haven't done before, is we actually put out an RFP to six um, media partners, potential partners, so TV, radio, publishers, and so forth, and said, if you had this sort of money, how would you spend it? We'd never done it like that. We'd always bought our own media and just plonked it here, there, and everywhere, just think sort of spatagun approach to a little bit of television, a little bit of radio, a little bit of buses, whatever it might be we would do. And we ended up, um, our key partner in this was a local radio station, WXRT. And they were phenomenal. We spent about $170,000 just with them. But the coverage we got was far beyond anything we could have done. So we got extensive commercial placements, special promo spots, tons of um, Bowie-themed content, huge presence on their website. And basically, they're complete Bowie nuts. So they just kept talking about it all the time which was great. They also enabled a couple of events which were so successful. One was a Bowie float at the Pride Parade. There was about a million people there. Um, and this goofy kind of float thing that we had. They also produced, um, on our behalf, these fans. And we had thousands of these. And literally thousands of people had these things waving. And not just at this event. This became a key piece of collateral, daft though it is, for us promoting the show, which was great. Um, a huge event in Daly Plaza, which is a big public area in Chicago. So huge reach because of the depth of that partnership that we have with WXRT. We also had one with JC Decoe and others in various newspapers, but we were very um, <coughs> careful about who we chose. Number three fundamental, and I'll try and keep this going, how do we build anticipation in terms of earned media? Very briefly, we created something called the Bowie 500 list. That's Bowie, uh, 500 media outlets, local, regional, national. And we made individual contact with each and every one of those. And we went way beyond the regular uh, arts and culture and media. I mean, we really um, went out to everybody with this content. Um, it actually ended up being the Bowie 1000. That's how many print and digital mentions we actually got for this, uh, for this show. So even though some of the press was kind of skeptical at first, once they got into the, to the feel of this, we did so well on our own media. The other thing that we did was Bowie wouldn't come and see the show despite our constant letters and requests. Iman was great, she didn't come, but she tweeted and posted all the time. David Bowie had made a policy not to come and see the show of any of the venues, which we respected. But in terms of a celebrity, this is something we've been wanting to do for some time, was to sort of boost the celebrity nature of our key curators. And Michael Darling is this, this, this young, handsome guy, and, and he's very charismatic. charismatic. But he did about 155 different interviews. He, he was relentless and so great to work with. And he literally got dozens and dozens of articles. He even ended up being voted one of Chicagoans of the year. So that way of using, if you can't have a celebrity, then think about how to use your curators to be able to do that, if they're up for it. Number four, how do we make the show our own creative advertising? So Jane, this is kind of fun because um, v &A had their own look. Um, a big, well-known logo, logo there'd be an A, Christ's sake, you can put that logo on there. And they used, and this isn't a terribly good example, I have to say, Jane, of, the, of, the, of your publications and your advertising, but it gives the sort of gist. Then when AGO, the Art, the Art Gallery Ontario, they picked up on a similar kind of flavour, and since then, Berlin, Paris, they very much used um, this kind of look. But it's really interesting, we said, if we're going to take the show on, how do we make it look feel right in the context of a contemporary museum. The show was individual to us. We were allowed to take a certain amount of liberties with the show. The V&A were incredibly good uh, 
partners to work with, in all, in all honesty. And we were able to pick and choose some of the works to make it fit for our space, which was so great. But we also wanted to have a look and feel that felt authentic to us and our brand image. And our goal is to attract audiences across music, fashion, art, performance, gender-related, identity issues, um, and therefore we used a multiple a range of images we felt was right for us. And we also wanted a system with advertising where we could be flexible around our messaging. So just very briefly, the 15 second commercial, <coughs> just to give you a bit of Bowie. sort of example of just the way we've used a number of different images. Um, but probably uh, the way that sort of continues is the look that we gave it. So we, we used a number of images. We also sort of abstracted those images. We went away from the four color look and started to use these kind of duotones, along with this David Bowie is, which was existing. But we put our own spin on that, so David Bowie is now. And then this is just a group of, these could be digital, they could be print, there was digital versions of all of these ads but the sense of his different personas, but also the sense that we could message it. So when it opened, it's sort of David Bowie is yours, it's there for you to take. But then once tickets started to sell, we were able to say David Bowie is selling fast. Or we'd be able to use lyrics, so David Bowie's fame, fame, fame. So it gave us a sort of broader um, uh, a sort of you know, palette of, of messaging and images that we could use um, to promote the show. <coughs> Then in terms of the way that translated onto sort of out of home stuff, we had a lot of fun. This was a huge, great big billboard out on the highway. Um, and the line of Starman has landed in Chicago, get your tickets before he's gone. So this again was, came sort of a halfway through the show, a big message, banners, sides of buses, digital um, things on the, on the side of the highway and so forth, really got it out there. And also the round, the round the building itself, we thought it was so important to sort of establish that Bowie was here. So we did a lot of work with, with uh, maximizing the visibility. We sort of picked special places around the museum related to, to where we were compared to other streets and so forth. Used lyrics, we put these lyrics on the steps as you walked up. The other thing that was really important that was so popular was this whole idea of a place to take selfies, for, pe for a place for people to share their uh, experiences. And the more of those we did, the more pictures people took of all of that kind of stuff. Social media, this was kind of fun. We fed it with some interesting ideas. You're probably aware of the film Labyrinth. We put dozens and dozens of these posters up on lamp posts that we produced ourselves, offering the services of the character that David Bowie played in Labyrinth as a babysitter. Um, you'll see people tore, it up, tore off. We got dozens and dozens of calls. When you phoned the number, you got through to the box office, surprise, surprise, and sold you a ticket. But it just generated over 100,000 shares. So, so the social media was a lot of the stuff that we kind of fed, and the subject matter was so much fun that we could have some real fun with it. People love stuff. I mean, we couldn't believe the collateral that people love. We printed around 30,000 individually designed tattoos that were out there. They, they tweeted and Facebooked and, and all over the place, badges and buttons, stuff to distribute. How do we exceed the visitor experience in terms of number five? I won't dwell on this. But we had, this was the first time we'd ever sold timed tickets. We'd never done that. We were a $12 entry fee. For this, we were $25 and the tickets were, were timed. We had to buy in a new system and we got Tessitura, which you're probably all familiar with. We could have a whole lecture on that, but let's not do that. Um, and we were able to really push upsell membership, collect information. We did this in kind of six months. We still don't really know how to use Tessitura in its full kind of use. <laughs> But we're kind of getting there. It's just to say it can be done. In six months, you can go from not having this to having it. And it is possible, and it's not a bad system. Um, just a quickie, we announced in early April that the tickets would go on sale on July the 31st. <coughs> and we got totally inundated with requests for tickets. People went crazy and started panicking. 
So, you know, call it opportunistic or wh whatever you like, but we created what we call the super fan ticket, um, which was 100 bucks. Um, and we so, sold close to 200 of those advanced tickets for 100 bucks each. Um, uh, we called them our super fans, and we then sent them stuff. We recorded their details, and we sent them little special things and Mark and stuff just to make them feel super special. It got picked up by the Wall Street Journal, which was a really nice story. So again, you never know when stories are going to come by. Just goes back to that selfie wall. This was an internal wall, um, which was really worth the money. It cost quite a lot to do. But the leverage we got in terms of people taking selfies, celebrities, that's uh, Usher in the middle, um, coaster, a cast of Chicago Fire on one of these shows. Um, but just, I mean, everybody wanted their picture taken in front of these. And of course, that generated a huge amount of social media. I'll skip over this, but there was this fantastic headphones tour where as you move towards a particular display or a video or a case or a piece of artwork, the headphones would start playing the right music, it would start telling you the right story, it had Bowie's voice, it had cur curatorial voice, and, and the feedback uh, from Exeter's from the show was that this was one of their favourite parts, was this technology. We served co coffee and co uh, cocoa to the queue outside. We built a special shop. We normally have a shop just on the ground floor. We had a fourth floor, Lee, as you exit type shop, 2,000 square feet. Um, um, sold, yeah, 2,700 product, products within this thing. Again, but we lent itself. In terms of how do we handle an exhibition of this scale in terms of ter internal processes, just very brief to, briefly, logistically, this was huge, and we formed a 10-person uh, group called the Bowie Team. So that was 10 people across the institution, marketing, design, security, finance, development. Every, every uh, department was represented. And those people were especially chosen for their ability to get things done. This wasn't a group that, group that could waffle and just talk. We had you know, a list, an agenda, and items that we had to get through. So, so you need someone that's really good at driving that kind of thing. Um, at the centre was this idea of, of our attendance, and we spent hours trying to decide how, how many hours do we need to be open to maximise our revenue on our, on our attendance. Lots of work on testing the capacity of the galleries, something we'd never had the luxury of needing to do, but our audiences aren't big enough. Um, timed entry and so forth. How do we even get to the admission price of 25? We did a lot of research. We kind of plonk in the middle and we felt kind of comfortable. So again, we had to go to the board and say, look, we've looked at this, $25 is the right price for this. This is just a very quick chart, days of the week across the top. Time's open for those days, we're closed on a Monday. The number of so rotations that we could do. So if we're open on a Tuesday from 10 till five, we can get 10 rotations in. And is a rotation 100 people, 125, or 150? So there was some real maths and logistics that went behind, and this is just a single page. But we ended up with this figure of 150,000 people in terms of, of content based on weeks, days, hours open. So just to say, you know, the systems and there's a way to think about these things. Um, Measuring success was hugely successful. We knew we need to provide senior staff and board trustees evidence of success of the show. It wasn't just going to be attendance. So five months out, we needed to understand the, you know, what's the universal uh, impact of the show going to be. So five months out, we, we started a, a measurement and tracking report. Much to, you know, we didn't want to have to do this, but it was something we knew was going to bite us in the bum later on if we didn't get ahead of the game. So we measured a lot, we created a, a, a dashboard um, and I won't go into the detail, but basically, you know, it's, it's attendance versus goal. The chart in the middle is sort of projection versus actual. Then you've got the breakdown of the most successful time slots, the most successful days, members versus non-members, online versus walk-ups, every single day of the show against goal. This was detail of that. It's just to show again, this, the, this has now become a general practice for us. This is how we record. Um, our daily attendance, and I report this in once a week at Director's Cabinet of how well we're doing based on a dashboard. So that's something that Bowie really kicked off for us. So the results finally, 193, 709 people came to see uh, David Bowie. Our highest day saw 4,400 visitors, and it was our most highly attended show um, in 47 uh, year history. And then in terms of just briefly and very finally, what did we learn? We call it now the new normal. 
So after Bowie was over, our director asked, what's our new normal now that we've done Bowie? Things will never be the same, will they? And to a certain extent, they're not. I can't see us rushing into another Bowie, but certainly some of the stuff that we learned, um, which is up there, which is kind of straightforward, but this weekly attendance dashboard is really great because it enabled us to tweak the messaging on our advertising. So for instance, weekends were absolutely packed, overbooked. Weekdays, you could walk in and have the place to yourself. It was really weird. So on a Wednesday at three, no matter how popular the show was, so seeing those attendance figures meant that we could push all of our advertising with a certain message, avoid the crowds, come during the week, get a discount, and so forth. The partnerships, of course, hugely popular. Less marketing partners, focus on fewer for bigger bang for your buck. Push the buy now, see our website messaging. So make sure the ads work as ads. What we have a history of doing is beautiful image, unknown artist name, date. The rest is left to the public. And with this, no, we, and we, I don't think we succeeded. I think actually we could have pushed harder to say buy your tickets, go online. Again, we were a little too precious about the art. Don't depend on pre-sales. We thought we were going to be completely sold out. Most people buy two or three days before. No matter how exciting the general pattern is, they leave it to the last minute. And then weekends over midweek, I mentioned. So hopefully there's a few tips. Thanks for listening. Um, I hope it's useful for, for you guys. Thank you.